just wanted to thank you all for coming to Science Club tonight. We appreciate the support. Uh, before we bring up the trivia, I just wanted to mention a couple things real quick. Um, we're looking for volunteers for the Science Club. So if you guys like this program and you're interested in getting involved, helping us out, we could always just support. The other thing I want to do is I want to thank our sponsors. So the Tapper, they provide this place for us for free every time we do this. for the winners of trivia, drink tokens for the presenter. It's really amazing what they do. So thank you, Taproot. And uh, if you guys could make sure to remember to tip your service. You know, they work really hard. The other thing I got to thank is Alaska Commons. They're one of our sponsors. They're an online magazine. They cover everything Alaska related. Um, they're also well known for um, their political journalism. So if you guys haven't checked that out, they've uh, won awards for what they've done. Uh, they're really good, so check them out. And the other thing is uh, UAA. So they help us publicize our events and their calendar for faculty and staff, and we appreciate the help that they do. Also, I wanted to mention that we are doing a fundraiser. We are selling coffee cups. On the front has the Anchored Science Club logo. On the back is the molecule for caffeine. Yeah. So we're asking $20, so think of it this way. It's $10 for the cup and then a $10 donation to the Science Club. It helps support us. It does cost money to put on these events, so we appreciate anything you guys can do. Thank you. Now I just want to bring up James for the trivia, and then we'll introduce the speaker and get you guys started tonight. Thank you. So to introduce our speaker, Travis has done uh, several science clubs now. He's one of our favorites. We really appreciate him coming back. He's a professor of physics and astronomy. See, I got it right that time. At UAA. For over 20 years, he has used giant telescopes at Kitt Peak National Observatory and Gemini Observatory to create color images to share the universe with the public. During that time, he has created over 200 images, many of which are in his new book, right here, that we have for sale up front. It's uh, $40. Usually it's 50 so you get a discount. And uh, he will also be willing to autograph them for you after the presentation. So thanks. telescope are about 300 megabytes in size each, 
uh, which nowadays is not such a big deal, but back then the largest hard drive we had was 20 uh, gigabytes. So that gives you a sense of how big the images were, were compared to our computer space. And this camera was, a, was one of the most powerful cameras ever built up to that time and still is actually pretty darn useful. And so when the camera is built, it had a very large field of view and we wanted to share that with people. The field of view of this camera is one square degree. To give you a sense of how big that is, if you hold your thumb out at arm's length and look at your thumbnail, your thumbnail is about the size of one degree on the sky. Does that look like a really big wide field of view? What do you think? It's pretty small, um, but by telescopic terms, it was considered huge. So one of the first images I made was to show off the field of view. And this is a picture of the moon uh, taken with this camera superimposed upon the star field. And believe it or not, that little square thumbnail of yours is the same as this field of view here. The moon only takes up about a quarter of the size of your thumbnail. So next time you see the moon out at night, hold your thumbnail up to the moon and you'll see that the moon is actually smaller than your thumbnail. Now, another thing we wanted to do is to show that many of the objects we look at in astronomy are actually larger than the moon. So this is a picture of what's called the Rosette Nebula. And this object right here actually is larger than the moon, or at least it would appear to be larger than the moon, if you can see it with one of your eyes, with your eyes. So one of the things I want you to take away from tonight is that many of the objects that you see pictures of in astronomy, you might think that these are objects that are too small and too far away for us to see, but actually many of these objects are just simply too faint. So if you were able to, if you had superhuman vision, you would actually be able to see the rosette on the sky and you'd notice that it actually looks bigger than the moon. So these are the first two images I ever made and they liked the images that I made so they asked me to do more. And this is an important lesson for you all. If you do something once, it's a favor. If you do it twice, it's your job. <laughs> so be careful what you do. And uh, so I continued to do this work for Kid Peak. And then in later years, I started doing this sort of work for other observatories, including this one right here. This is called Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory in Chile. And I also make these sorts of images uh, for the Gemini telescopes. Uh, Gemini, as you can imagine by the name, is, is, consists of two nearly identical telescopes. One is on the summit of Mount Kea, the big island of Hawaii, and then the other one is on Cerro Bouchon in Chile. So for over 20 years I've been making these images. I've made over 200 images in that time, and uh, a lot of people have asked me questions about the images, and so what I wanted to do tonight was answer a lot of those questions that uh, I often get asked. So people often ask me, why do we make these images? Well, as you can imagine, the first reason we do it is to help visualize scientific results. We make these images not only uh, for astronomers like myself to be able to learn things about the objects we're looking at, but also to share uh, with people the science that we're doing with these telescopes. We also make these images to demonstrate new technologies that we've built. So, for example, this is a picture uh, with one of the Gemini 8 meter telescopes using a technology called adaptive optics. And adaptive optics is a technology that is able to counteract the blurriness of the Earth's atmosphere. So this image right here actually has, uh, is sharper than what the Hubble Space Telescope can do. And what you're seeing in this picture right here, these objects right here are stars that are being shot out of the Orion Nebula at very high speeds. And then finally, and probably the most fun reason we make these images, is to simply make images to share with people to show you the beautiful things that our telescopes can see. So over the years, people have also wanted to know whether or not these images are real. So this is a Calvin and Hobbes cartoon uh, from back in 1988, which is before Photoshop. It just goes to show how amazing Calvin and Hobbes was at predicting the future. And so when I show my images to people, when I show astronomical images, these are questions I often get. Is this what it really looks like? Are the colors real? Or even, if I were standing right next to this, is this what I would see? And these are all very good questions to ask. We'll just kind of put aside for a moment the question of what does it mean to stand right next to a galaxy? Um, <laughs> But what people are really wanting to know with these questions is, is whether or not what they're seeing is real objects. So what I like to do is to show people this comparison. So this right here is a picture of a famous object. Does anyone know what this is? The Horsehead, right? So this is the Horsehead Nebula. Anyone know why it's called the Horsehead? Because it looks like a horse's head. 
because it looks like the horse is in this room. <laughs> so this is uh, one of the most famous objects in the night sky. This is a picture also taken with a mosaic camera. And this picture right here is again about the size of your thumbnail. So if you could see it, this is an object that would appear to be bigger than the moon. So let's imagine that you were able to get in a spaceship and you were able to fly the thousands of light years that it takes to get out to this nebula. And then you get out there and you look out the window. Well, this is what you would see. So even though you took your spaceship and got a lot closer to this object, you still couldn't see the nebula. And so when people ask me questions like, is this what it really looks like? Unless what you're looking at is pretty much all black, the answer is no. <laughs> so why is that? Well, there's a couple reasons. The first has to do with something called surface brightness. Surface brightness is a ratio of how much light is coming from an object to how big the object appears in the sky. Now, as you're flying in your spaceship out to the Horsehead Nebula, you're getting more light from the object because you're closer to it, but the object is also getting bigger. So it turns out that ratio of surface brightness stays the same. And this is actually something you can do at home. Walk towards a wall, and as you walk towards the wall, you'll notice that the wall is getting bigger, but it's not actually getting brighter. So what this means is, is that if you cannot see the object from standing here on Earth, even if you got closer to it, you still would not be able to see it. And again, the Horsehead Nebula is plenty big enough for you to see. It's bigger than the moon in the sky. It's just simply too faint for you to see. So even if you got much closer to it, you still wouldn't be able to see it. And this is the whole reason why we build telescopes, is to be able to allow us to see things we wouldn't normally be able to see. Now another problem with our eyes is, is that our eyes are not very good at seeing color in faint light. If you look up at stars at the night sky, there's only a handful of stars that are actually bright enough for your eyes to see color in. So there's a bright red star in the constellation of Orion that's called Betelgeuse. You can see that it's red. And there's a few other stars as well, but pretty much all the other stars in the sky just look black or white. So our eyes are not able to see color very well. And in particular, we're not very good at seeing red light. And the reason why this is important is because the universe is full of hydrogen gas. Most of the gas in the universe is hydrogen. And when hydrogen is hot, it produces a specific color of red light that's called what? Hydrogen alpha. That was one of the trivia questions. This is like a great novel as it's unfolding. <laughs> so most people can see that red light, but just barely. And most of the, much of the light that's being produced in the universe is that specific color of red light, and our eyes are not very good at seeing it. And not only that, there's other kinds of light that our eyes can't see. You've probably heard of them. X-rays, infrared light, radio waves, ultraviolet, things like that. These are all kinds of light that are out in the universe that our eyes cannot see. So an analogy that one of my co-authors on the book likes to use is imagine you have a piano keyboard with 88 keys on it. What our eyes can see is analogous to if your ears could only hear one of those keys on the keyboard. So let's imagine you're listening to Debussy and all you're hearing is that one key. It's not very interesting, is it, right? So that's the problem, is that our eyes, as remarkable as they are at seeing things during the day, are terrible at seeing things at night, and there's all these other kinds of light that our eyes can't see at all. So the reason why we build telescopes is to give us superhuman vision, to literally allow us to see things that are invisible to us. It wouldn't make any sense to spend billions of dollars building instruments like the Hubble Space Telescope if the Hubble saw exactly what your eyes saw. So when you look at these images, you're not seeing them as you would see them, but as our telescopes would see them. So when we talk about telescopes, there's three important things to know that telescopes can do. And when people think of telescopes, they usually think of just the first one. They think of the magnification. They think of telescopes as being like a super duper telephoto lens that makes something that's very far away look close. Just like if you're at a hockey game and uh, you're up in the seats far away and you can't see the action down below. And it's true that telescopes magnify things, but that's just one of the many things that they do. Just as importantly, they also are able to collect lots of light. Our eyes are marvelous instruments, but they're not good at collecting light. 
And then finally, as I mentioned before, our telescopes are designed to allow us to see these kinds of light that our eyes can't see. So let's take a moment to think about our eyes. This is a picture of an eye, not to scale. And the opening, the pupil that allows light through, even when it's fully dilated in nighttime, is only about a quarter of an inch wide, so just, just a teeny tiny amount. So all the light that you're seeing right now is coming through that teeny tiny hole. Now in comparison, this is the size of the Gemini 8 meter mirror telescope. What you're seeing here is this is the mirror surface right here that collects light. And this is, for comparison, a picture of one of the technicians who just finished coating the surface of the mirror and checking it out. So this entire mirror is what's used to collect light for the Gemini telescope. It's 8 meters across, or about 27 feet. And at any given moment, this mirror is collecting over a million times more light than what your eyes can see. Now, not only that, our telescopes are able to do long exposures. Our eyes are like a video camera. They're taking exposures continuously, about 30 times a second. So what that means is, is that every single exposure that you see with your eyes has been collecting light for only 1 30th of a second. Whereas our telescopes are designed to collect light for long periods of time. As you probably all know, the Earth turns, and as it turns, it causes the stars to move across the sky. Our telescopes are designed to track objects as they move across the sky. So what you're seeing in this time-lapse movie here is the Gemini North 8-meter telescope following an object as it moves across the sky. And this allows us to look at an object for many hours at a time. And one of the trivia questions had to do with what's called the Hubble Extreme Deep Field, which is the deepest image that's ever been made with any telescope. Now the Hubble Deep Field is the extreme deep field is just of this small square of the sky. And the moon here is for comparison. Someone just recently asked me, why did they look at something right next to the moon? Isn't that really dumb? It's like, no, the moon wasn't here. The moon was somewhere else. The moon is just here to put it to scale. So the Hubble Space Telescope stared at this region of the sky for about two million seconds, which is, took in total 50 days to do. And the final image that came out is the one that you saw before. And if you use any other telescope for a shorter period of time, you'll see very little in this portion of the sky. But if you stare at it long enough, you'll see all of these galaxies in here. Each one of these smudges here, whether they be big or small, is a galaxy that has trillions of stars inside of it. And in this picture here, there's some of them that have circles next to them. And these are the most distant galaxies ever seen. In fact, the most distant galaxies you can see in this field are about, currently, these objects are about 30 billion light years away. So yes, it is possible to see objects that are more than 13.8 billion light years. And I can explain more in the Q&A if you're interested. Now, when you see this image right here, this image is in color. But our CCDs actually do not see color intrinsically. All telescopes that look at optical and infrared light are designed to use filters. So this picture right here shows an object called the Crescent Nebula. Can anyone guess why it's called the Crescent Nebula? It looks like a crescent. The astronomers aren't very interested in it. <laughs> so this is a single picture taken with the, the mosaic camera on Kitt Peak. And so to make a color image, what we do is we look at it through multiple filters. This is a picture of the filter wheel on the mosaic camera. Each one of these squares here is a filter that's about five inches on a side. Each one of these costs about $10,000, and so they don't let the astronomers touch them. Uh, they have technicians whose job is to put them in and take them out. So what we'll do is we'll first take a picture through the blue filter, and then take another picture through the red filter, and then take another picture through the green filter, and then we can stack them all together, and what we'll get in the end is an image that looks something like this. And so in this way, we're able to produce a color image. Now, you may not realize it, your phone, the camera inside your phone, does the exact same thing. Inside your phone are little CCD cameras, and there are little teeny tiny color filters over the pixels. And that's how your camera is able to produce a color image in much the same way. So when people ask uh, if the colors are real, when we think of color, we have to think about how our eyes work. So you may know that our eyes have two types of detectors in them called rods and cones. 
The cones are what allow us to see color, and the rods are what allow us to see black and white. So remember earlier I said that our eyes usually cannot see color in most stars, it's only the brightest stars, and that's because most stars are too faint for our cones to see. So this picture right here shows the different kinds of colors that the three different types of cones in our eyes can see. The S cone, which stands for short wavelength, sees mostly blue light. The M cone for medium wavelength sees mostly green and yellow light. And the L cone for long wavelength sees mostly yellow and red. And so the way this works is, is that your eye has all these different types of cones inside there. And when you look at something, your brain is able to figure out the color of something depending on how much light each one of those cones is able to detect. So when I look at this gentleman's yellow jacket right here, I can tell that it's yellow because the cones inside my eye, the S cones are saying, well, I'm not really seeing much of anything. And the M and L cones are saying, oh boy, I'm seeing a lot of light right now. And it's able to figure out that his coat is yellow. So the way that your brain knows that something is yellow or red or whatever depends on the relative amount of these three different types of light that your eyes can see. Now, we can simulate that pretty well using the filters inside our, our telescope. So these right here show three of the different kinds of filters we have called B for blue, R for red, and V for visible, because again, astronomers can't do anything reasonable. And this is the blue and the green and the red, and they match up very closely to the S, the M, and the L cones inside your eyes. So we can create a color image in a way very similar to what your eye does by looking at an object through those three filters and then seeing the relative amounts of light in each of those. And so if something looks red, that's because it looks brighter in the R filter than it does in the B and the V. So when you see color, it's a relative amount amounts of those different colors of light. Now if you look here, you'll notice that there's actually other kinds of filters here. So there's one here called U for ultraviolet and I for infrared. So these are kinds of light that your eyes can't see, but our cameras can see. So many of the images that you see in astronomy are made with these blue, green, and red filters, and these are often called true color images. Uh, but we often make images using these other kinds of filters as well. And sometimes those are called true colors images too, even though people don't really know how to use the term. <laughs> now to make things even more complicated, there's other kinds of filters that we use. And so what this right here shows is specific kinds of filters that we use to see specific colors of light that are produced by certain types of gas. And I've already told you about hydrogen alpha, which is this guy right here. It's a specific color of red light produced by warm hydrogen gas. And then right next to it is another type of red light called sulfur-2. Can you guess what produces sulfur-2 light? <laughs> You guys are good, yeah. Sulfur. And then oxygen three, can you guess that one? And then we have also hydrogen beta, because hydrogen actually, and all these elements, produce more than one kind of color. So what we do is we use what are called narrow band filters, and these are filters that only allow that very specific color of light to go through. And what it does is it allows us to see what those specific types of atoms are doing in the nebula or the galaxy that we're looking at. Now one thing I'll mention is, is that hydrogen and alpha sulfur 2 are two different kinds of red light, but your eyes can't tell the difference because they're so close to each other they look essentially the same. So your eyes can't tell them apart, but our telescopes can. So when we make images, sometimes we use phrases other than true color and false color because if something sounds like false color, it sounds like it's not real, right? So sometimes we use what's called natural color, which is the phrase that we use to describe something if we use like blue, green, and red filters. And then we'll use the phrase representative colors for other types of color combinations to show that what we're doing is representing the science inside the images. So here's a side-by-side -side comparison of two images of the same galaxy. The first one is an image produced by just blue, green, and red filters. And then on the right, we have the same galaxy where we've actually used eight filters to look at. And in particular, we use filters that are specially, specially designed to see that hydrogen alpha light. And this is produced by warm clouds of hydrogen gas inside the galaxy. So if you look at these two galaxies, uh, you'll notice that it's actually easier to see these clouds of gas in the image on the right than the one on the left. 
And so this is a way that we can use these filters to show us more detail inside the object we're looking at. So the way we make one of these images is we take images of an object through many different filters, and then we assign a color to each one of those and then combine them together. So for example, this is a black and white picture of a spiral galaxy called the Triangulum Galaxy. And this is what it looks like through the B or blue filter. And then here's another black and white image of the same galaxy as seen through the hydrogen alpha filter. And so you can see how different it looks in these two images. In the first image here, in the B filter, what you're seeing is mostly the blue light from hot blue massive stars inside the galaxy. Whereas in this filter, we're seeing the warm hydrogen gas inside the galaxy. So the reason why astronomers use these different kinds of filters is it allows us to study different things going on in whatever object we're looking at. Now to make a color image, what we do is we take each one of these filters and we assign it a specific color. So in the case of this object, for this image, I made the hydrogen alpha red because that is the intrinsic color of the filter. When I say intrinsic, what I mean is, is if you were to take this filter and hold it up next to a bright white light, this color, the filter would look red to you. Now the next filter I use is a filter called the I-band or infrared filter. And the good question to ask is, is what color should I make a type of light that your eyes can't see? And what I chose was orange, and the reason why is because I wanted something close to red. Infrared literally means below red. But I didn't want to use red because I've already used red for the hydrogen alpha, and I want them to stand out differently. Now for the R filter, which does show red light, I decided to make that yellow, and yes, that's cheating just a little bit. And then for the V filter, which is green, I made that green. The B filter is blue. And then the final filter is the U filter, the ultraviolet. And then when we combine them all together, this is the final image that you see. So in this image, we uh, use six, to produce this image, we use six filters. And by doing so, we're able to see detail inside the galaxy even better than we could before. So right here, you can see the hydrogen alpha filter shows us this cloud of hydrogen gas where hot massive stars inside the, the cloud have just recently formed. Now, many of the images we make actually uh, use less light. And these use, again, these narrow band filters that are designed to allow us to see just very specific things. So this is, again, a picture of the Horsehead Nebula. And in this picture, I use just narrow band filters, the hydrogen alpha, the oxygen three, and the sulfur two. And then by doing that, I'm actually blocking out other kinds of light, and it allows me to see detail better in here. So for example, in this image, there are these wispy streaks inside the nebula that you don't see if you use broadband filters, but you can see if you use the narrow band filters. So at this point, you may be thinking, well, gee, these guys can just do whatever the heck they want. They just have all these different filters, and they can combine them in whatever way they want. How can we believe any of the things that we're seeing? But when we make these images, we, do, we make these images to convey the signs. We make these images so that you can look at the image and start to understand and interpret the image without there even necessarily being any text with it. And this is something that artists call visual grammar. And visual grammar is the way that our eyes are able to read an image. When we look at an image, our brain is already starting to process subconsciously what it is we're seeing. So for example, when I show you this picture, tell me, which half of the image do you think is further away? The top half or the bottom half? The top half. The top half. That's the easy part. Why? Does it look fainter? How about the color? Is the color of the top half different than the bottom half? How is it different? Lighter. It looks lighter. It looks a little washed out. It looks bluer. So it looks bluer. Can anyone uh, tell me why it looks bluer? Why, why would the top half look bluer than the bottom half? Oh my god. Okay. The reason why it looks bluer, and some of you are saying this, is because we're looking off at hills and mountains off in the distance. And to look at those objects, we're looking through the Earth's atmosphere, which, as you all know, is blue, right? Well, unless you're in Anchorage in the winter. <laughs> so our brains naturally know 
things that are blue are off in the distance because we understand that the sky turns distant objects blue. Now another visual cue we use is that when you look at this picture, we're seeing trees and bushes throughout most of the image. And our brains make an assumption that these trees are all roughly the same size. That is to say that maybe one's a little bit taller, one's a little bit shorter, but it's not like one tree is six feet tall and another tree is like half an inch tall. Right? Our brains make the assumption these are all roughly the same size. And so we can tell that these trees, like this guy right here, must be closer because it looks intrinsically, it looks like it's bigger than the trees off in the distance. So if we assume that they have all the same intrinsic size, the smaller ones must be further away. So these are visual cues that our brains use to naturally interpret an image and make it look three-dimensional. Now for comparison, the Apollo astronauts, when they went to the moon back in the 60s and 70s, they had a devil of a time getting around because they didn't have an atmosphere. And so when they were looking around, it was very hard for them to tell the distance to objects. So for example, this right here, is this a giant mountain off in the distance, or is it just a hill just right next to the lander? It was very hard for the astronauts to be able to figure that out because they lacked that important visual cue that we use to measure distance. Now similarly, this is uh, an astronomical image of uh, the Lagoon Nebula taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And people often say to me, wow, how does Hubble see in 3D? Does it have like special glasses over the, the front of it or something? How does it do that? And Hubble can't see in 3D. Uh, in fact, there's really only one telescope that watches the sun that can do this. And so the reason why this image looks three-dimensional is the same reason why that first picture of the hills looks three-dimensional. So when we look at this image, is our, this brain, our brains naturally tell us that the bluer regions in here look like they're further away than the colors that are yellow and red. So in, in art parlance, the cooler colors, the blues and greens, look like they're further away. And the warmer colors, the yellows, reds, and oranges, look like they're closer. And so in this image, this object looks three-dimensional, even though it is not inherently a 3D picture. And to make this more clear, this is a picture of another object called the Keyhole Nebula. The picture on the left is, of course, in color, and the one on the right is black and white. And the one on the left, I think, is much easier to interpret. You can imagine this as being a real place in outer space, whereas the picture on the right just looks like some sort of abstract black and white sketch. Once you take away the color, you lose that ability to perceive depth. So by using color, our brains are naturally able to interpret things about what they're looking at. Now another way in which we use color is actually to apply temperature. We naturally think of things that are red as being hot and things that are blue as being cold because most flames, except for the flame on a natural gas stove, are red and ice for the most part is blue. It's actually, in science, just the opposite. The blue things are the hot things. So the hottest stars in the universe are blue stars, the coolest stars are yellowish and reddish stars. But because of our daily experiences, we think of red as being hot and blue as being cold because we've all heard of red hot or maybe white hot, but we've never heard of blue hot, right? And that's because if you try to make something hot enough that it would turn blue here on Earth, it just melts. But stars up in space can achieve those temperatures. So we think about these things when we try to create an image that tells a scientific story. The point of all of our images is to try to convey the science of what it is that you're looking at and to look good as we do it. So this is an example of an image that we made where we use visual grammar to help make the image more intuitive. The picture on the left is that same triangular galaxy that I showed you earlier. It was taken through an optical telescope on Kid Peak. And the image on the right shows the same image on the left, but we've added data from a radio telescope called the Very Large Array. Did any of you see the movie Contact with Jodie Foster? She's out there with the headphones and there's all those sat giant satellite dishes there. That's a radio telescope. And you can't hear radio waves, by the way, I'll just say that. <laughs> Jodie Foster did a disservice to all the science community with that movie. And more reasons than one. So, that radio telescope can see cold hydrogen gas. You'll notice that up to this point I've been saying that the hydrogen alpha light is, comes from warm hydrogen gas inside uh, the galaxy. Cold hydrogen gas is not energetic enough or hot enough to produce light that we can see with our eyes, 
but it can produce radio waves. Radio waves are a low energy form of light that our eyes cannot see. So we combined radio data with optical data. So the question was, what color do we make the radio waves? Again, the challenge here is, is you can't see radio waves, so what's a color that makes it reasonable uh, when we make these sorts of images? Well, we chose purple or violet uh, because of two reasons. The first is, is that violet is a mix of red and blue. And this gas right here, the cold hydrogen gas, is the same kind of gas as the gas in the warm hydrogen alpha clouds. So we wanted them to blend naturally so that people would be able to understand that these are connected. If we use a color like green, they don't blend, and it looks like this gas here is not connected to this gas, and that's not true, they are connected. The other thing is, is that we wanted a color that had blue in it, because again, most people think of blue as meaning something's colder. So we wanted people to look at this image and naturally be able to interpret that this gas right here is connected to this gas right here, but this gas is colder, and that's exactly what's going on. Now, I'll be the first to admit that we probably overthought this when we made this image. Probably most people are like, yeah, that's cool, whatever, and then go to the next page. Um, but that's the thinking that goes into making these images. So one thing that I want you to know is, is when we make these images, the challenge is, is how do we take what the telescope can see and turn it into something that you can see and do it in a way that what you're seeing looks authentic. That is, it doesn't look like something that was in you know, the recent blockbuster movie. Sometimes people ask me, is there a conflict between art and science? How can something be fun to look at? How can something be pretty uh, and still be scientifically accurate? Which kind of implies that for it to be scientifically accurate, it has to be really boring. Which is a shame, because I don't think that's true at all. I think what I do is pretty darn awesome. And so, one of the things I like to emphasize is, is that there's no conflict at all. When we make these images, we're trying to use the tool that artists have learned for years to make an image that's, uh, that naturally conveys what's going on. So I spent many years kind of just learning by accident some of these tools, and then I talked with a friend who was an art major. She's like, oh yeah, we learned that in Art 101. You didn't know that? <laughs> Everyone knows that. So we try to use the tools of art to convey something scientific. And this is a picture of was called the Iris Nebula, and I'll let you guess why. And this is a picture that actually, we made an image first, and then as in the process of making an image, we got some cool science out of it. If you zoom in, uh, you'll notice there are these little red blobs in here, and as you can probably guess, these are produced uh, by warm hydrogen gas. And what you're looking at is a dark cloud of gas where new stars are forming. And one of the challenges is, is seeing what those new stars are up to because they're in these thick clouds of gas and it's hard to see inside. So by making an image in this way, we're able to see just these little faint specks of warm hydrogen gas inside where these stars are forming. Now if I turn this into a black and white image and amplify the red light, you're able to see this more easily. Even, uh, easily. And what you're seeing here, these objects, are what are called herbic hero objects. And these are jets of gas that are being shot out of stars that are forming there. And if you look inside this cloud of gas using uh, the Spitzer Infrared Space Telescope, we, can, we were able to find that there's a bunch of stars that are indeed forming there. So this is a fun example of how you, we went the other direction. Usually we have an interesting scientific result, and we make a color image to illustrate that. In this case, we made a color image, and out of that, we got an interesting scientific result. So sometimes it can go both ways. So as I mentioned before, I've made uh, over 200 images over the years, and I keep all of these images, or nearly all of them, uh, on my own personal website. Um, UAA does not do a very good job of naming websites, so it's easier if you just Google my name. But if you're interested in finding some of my images, uh, I do have a website. Fortunately, Travis Rector is a unique enough name. I'm easy to find. And on this website, I have many of the images I've made over the years. Uh, not only images that I've made through telescopes, but images of some of the cool telescopes that I've gotten to use over the years. And uh, I've also got some of my panorama images of some of the observatories as well. And as was mentioned at the start, uh, along with some co-authors of mine, 
uh, we've written a book called Coloring the Universe. And our book is all about how these images are made. And it was published by the University of Alaska Press this uh, November. It's 250 pages with over 300 astronomical images. And uh, I'm just pleased with Punch and how it came out. So if you're interested in seeing the book and getting a copy, um, there is a display copy at the back here uh, the, uh, where you came in. And we also have books up here. So after the Q&A, if, you uh, if you'd like to see the book or get a copy, I'd be happy to sell you one. They normally sell for $50, but I'll sell you one for $40. Cash, credit card, and check accepted. <laughs> and um, and uh, just to wrap up, I have this cool little video that we made. Uh, what's called a book trailer. I didn't know what a book trailer was until about a month ago. Uh, a book trailer isn't like a movie trailer, but it's for a book. And so this is the book trailer that we made of Kip Peak, of visiting Kip Peak National Observatory. So this has audio. Uh, hopefully the audio works. at an image of space, say like a galaxy or nebula, and wondered, is this real? Is this what it really looks like? Or maybe you even ask yourself, if I were standing right next to this object, is this what I would see? Hi, I'm Travis Rector, and I'm a professional astronomer. For the last 20 years, I've been coming here to Kitt Peak National Observatory in Arizona to make beautiful images of space using the giant telescopes here. Along with my collaborators, Kim Arcan and Megan Watsky of the Chandra X-ray Observatory, we have written a book called Coloring the Universe, which gives you a behind the scenes look at how these beautiful images of space are made with a professional telescope. We're now inside the dome of the Mayall 4 meter telescope. This is the largest telescope on Kitt Peak and is one of my favorite to use. In our book, we have over 300 color images of space, many of which were taken with this telescope. With this, we can see objects that are over 100 million times fainter than what the human eye can see. We're now inside the control room of the 4-meter telescope. This is where the astronomers sit when they're observing at night. When we're observing, we observe from dusk to dawn because telescope time is precious. For every five astronomers who ask for time, only one will get it. So this computer here is what's used to control the camera that takes the pictures. Behind me is where the telescope operator sits. The telescope operator is the celestial taxi driver. He or she is the one who points the telescope to the object that we're looking at. Professional telescopes like these give us superhuman vision. They literally allow us to make the invisible visible. In Coloring the Universe, we explain how we use these giant telescopes to make color images of space. We hope you enjoy this behind-the-scenes look at how professional astronomers see the universe. Thank you. So you've learned two things. One is I can't act, and two, I only have one sweater. <laughs> so I'd be happy to uh, take any questions you might have about anything I've talked about or anything else astronomy related. Yes, sir, in the back. Can you explain the principle of how you can see objects? Okay, so you're asking about the trivia question. So this gentleman wants to know, how can you see something that's more than 13.8 billion light years away? So as you probably know, a light year is a measure of how far light will travel in a single year. And to give you a sense of how fast light is, it can travel 186,000 miles in one second. My car just uh, crossed that threshold uh, last summer. Uh, it took me uh, 15 years to do it, but light can do it in one second. And so you might think, well, if, something, if the universe has only been around for 13.8 billion years, how can we see something more than 13.8 billion light years away? Wouldn't it take too much time for the light to get here? And the answer is that would be true if the universe was not expanding. So the important thing to know is, is that the universe is expanding. And as it's doing that, objects are being taken away from each other. 
So the object that's that galaxy that's 30 billion light years away, that's how far away it is now, not how far away it was when it emitted that light. When the light we're seeing in that Hubble Extreme Deep Field image left, the, uh, it was much closer to us. And in the time that it took for the light to travel to us, the universe has expanded. And so when we talk about the distance to an object, we're usually talking about how far away it is now, and that's how we can see something that's 30 billion light years away. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, in that image, no. The images show it as the filters actually see it. You can actually adjust for redshift. Uh, if, you, if you measure the redshift, then you could adjust how it actually appears to a certain degree. Yes? Question. Another question over here? Okay, so this gentleman's question is, uh, how, could the, how could the Hubble Space Telescope look at for something that long if it's in orbit around the Earth? So the important thing to know is, is that Hubble is in what's called a low Earth orbit. It's essentially in the same orbit as the space station and where the space shuttle would go. It's only about 300 miles above the Earth. A common misconception people have about Hubble is they think that Hubble actually flies out to the objects that it looks at. And it kind of looks like it has wings on it. Those are actually solar panels, so it's easy to imagine why people would think that. But it's actually in a low Earth orbit, and it takes about 90 minutes for it to go around the Earth. Now, depending on what object it's looking at, for roughly half that time, the Earth might be in the way. So for the Hubble Extreme Deep Field, they looked at a field in the sky this up in what's called the continuous viewing zone, which is that it's looking north so that no matter where it is in its orbit, it can look up. But what I'll actually mention is you mentioned 50 hours. Actually, you spent 50 days doing that. So it actually took even longer than that. There was a hand down here. Did someone have a question? Over here? Yes, sir. Okay, so this question was, who owns the images? Uh, it depends on the telescope. So all of the telescopes uh, operated by NASA, which includes like Hubble and Chandra and Spitzer, all of the images produced with those telescopes, the images are in the public domain. So anyone can use them for however they want. And, and unfortunately, people do a lot of really awful things <laughs> to some of these images. Most of the images that I make are copyrighted to the observatory for which they're made. In general, uh, we, we put very few restrictions on how the images are used. All of our images are put online at full resolution, so people can download them and do whatever they want. The only restrictions we put on it is, is that we don't want them used uh, to, be, uh, to be used for promoting commercial products or to be used uh, for promoting political or non-scientific ideas. So uh, if people want to use them for science, that's great. If they want to use them to teach or to enjoy, that's great too. Uh, but if you're creating a website talking about how someone is to spawn a Satan, we don't like that. <laughs> so we don't allow it. Yeah, so this question, so he's asking us, do we, do we uh, release the images uh, without the, the colors assigned so that people can create their own, own images? And the answer is, in general, yes, we do. Uh, most of the telescopes have a website where you can go to their database and download whatever data you want. You can create your own versions. Uh, and in fact, we encourage this. So Hubble, you can access all the Hubble data, all the Chandra data. Some of the telescopes that I use have been behind the curve in getting their websites up and running. So not all of the data is, is, is available. Uh, but in general, we make things as transparent as possible. So people can download the same data we use. They can make their own versions of their image. They can check our data to see if we're doing anything tricky uh, with it. And so, yeah, so they can do that. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so uh, so her question was, as was that 50 days total or was it 50 days for each filter? And it's actually 50 days total. 
No single exposure was taken for more than about 1,000 seconds or about 15 minutes. And so there's actually more than just three filters that they used. I think they used five to eight. I can't remember the exact number. And that's what was used to produce the final color image. So the 50 days was the total amount of time spending. And they, and they, and they did, generated hundreds of images through many different filters. No, uh, these objects are so far away that unless you were observing them for billions of years, you wouldn't notice them moving. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, what kind of, or will the James Webb Space Telescope have filters, and if so, what, what kind? So you probably all heard of what's called James Webb Space Telescope, which is uh, being uh, is often being uh, described as the successor to Hubble. And it really isn't, because it's a different kind of telescope. It does primarily infrared light. And so it will have filters, uh, and it'll work in a way similar to Hubble, but it's looking mostly at infrared light. So it's actually going to be more like the Spitzer Space Telescope in that way. But it'll be incredibly powerful. And the reason why we're interested in infrared light is because it'll allow us to see uh, what's going on in the most distant galaxies. So. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, you can tour uh, Kitt Peak National Observatory, and I s highly encourage you to do so. Uh, it's not far from Tucson, on, and on just about every clear night, they have what's called the Night Observing Program. You can go out for the day, get a tour of the telescopes during the day, and then at night, you get to look through some of the telescopes, and it's really a lot of fun. So if you're ever in Arizona and uh, you have an opportunity, I highly encourage you to do that. It's a very popular program, so you'll want to call in advance to make reservations. Currently, they do not offer tours of the Hubble Space Telescope. It's a little bit hard to get to it. Uh, but most observatories on the ground do have uh, a visitor center and places where you can go to see the telescopes. Yes, sir. Okay, so his question is, is how, if we look at something like with Hubble and something with Chandra, uh, how do we combine the images uh, to make a single image? One of the biggest challenges is that when you look uh, at an object through telescopes that are very different, like an optical telescope like Hubble and an X-ray telescope like Chandra, uh, you're often seeing very different kinds of things inside the galaxy. So when you look at a galaxy uh, for example, with an optical telescope, most of the light you're seeing is coming from stars, dust, and gas inside the galaxy. If you look with an X-ray telescope, most of the light you're seeing comes from very peculiar types of stars like X-ray binaries, uh, black holes, and also there might be a giant black hole at the center of the galaxy as well. And so when you make images that combine them, you're often seeing very different things. And so the challenge is, is to create an image that shows what each telescope is seeing even though they often see very different things. So. Other questions? Yes, no? OK. Well, thank you all. I hope you enjoyed my talk. And again, uh, we do have books if you're interested in seeing one. Thank you.